welcome everybody. A very hearty welcome to you all. It's a very special occasion, I think. My name is Gwenda B. Davey, and I'm the chair of the Melbourne branch of the Friends <laughs> International Film and Sound Archive. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that wherever we are today, wherever we're actually standing or sitting today, uh, we are for this, this uh, event, we are on Aboriginal land and land that has never been ceded. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. There are several people I particularly want to welcome and introduce to you today. Gary Sturgis, the filmmaker who produced the wonderful film Barry Jones in Search of Lost Time. Barry Jones AC, one of Australia's leading thinkers. Philip Noyce, filmmaker and patron of the Friends of the National Film and Sound Archive. Ray Edmondson, national president of the Friends of the NFSA, who initiated this webinar. And our very own Melbourne committee member, Peter Krauss, film critic and broadcaster, who will conduct this Q&A today. If you have questions or comments, please use the chat button and Bruce Watson will invite you to speak at the appropriate time. Peter, it's now over to you. Thanks very much, Gwenda. And it's uh, great to see everyone. Welcome to this uh, very special uh, Q&A discussion. And uh, it's great to be able to talk to Gary Sturgis, who is the writer, director and editor of uh, Barry Jones in Search of Lost Time, a film story, and that's very significant. Um, and of course, Barry Jones, terrific to see you and to talk to you. And perhaps we can lead off with the all important question, how did it all begin uh, in terms of this film and uh, collaborating, Gary, you and Barry collaborating to make this film? So how was that concept? Uh, arrived at? It all began, uh, Peter and everybody, well, um, it's nice to see everyone there, with um, the National Library um, asking me uh, to do Barry's oral history. And um, I think we had 16 and a half hours of recorded time. And in the course of that, um, you know, naturally, um, I'm confronted with Barry and his extraordinary knowledge and depth and breadth. And uh, it lived um, an extraordinary life. So it, it um, occurred naturally that he would be a great subject for a film. And um, although I um, made television, I'd done a lot of oral history, I'd done a lot of radio documentaries, I'd never made a cinema film. And um, perhaps it is the power of film and the fantasy of film and the lure of film that made me um, want to make a film and, and have it shown in a cinema. And with Barry, I thought that I had a very, very good subject for exploring um, the concept of making a film and all that that entails. I think that's the short, the short answer. Um, there are longer answers, of course. Of course, and we'll explore some of those. Barry, how did you respond to being the subject of uh, Gary's film? Well, I was, I was surprised, but touched. And it, it, what had happened quite often was that um, when uh, we had the oral history, um, which as I said, went on for 16 and a half hours, sometimes there'd be the odd moment of tension because he would ask me to explain some aspects of my life. And I'd say, look, I've written about this in the autobiography. It's elegantly expressed there. And uh, I'll simply um and ah, if, 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 you say, if you say, paraphrase what you put in the book. If you want to see how I dealt with a particular situation as a kid, 
there it is in the it distilled in the book. So poor poor Gary, I think, was a victim that sometimes there was a bit of eye rolling on my part. But then he got the idea of the film, and I want to emphasize it is absolutely his idea. I mean, I was touched, and of course I'm happy to collaborate with it, but it was absolutely his. It's not really quite a collaboration in the except to the extent to which an actor who devotes some time to being directed, you know, is, is part of the mix. But it's not it's the director's film, not the subject. Okay. <laughs> Very good to hear. So, Gary, let's talk about using uh, Barry's uh, autobiography, which I think is a thinking read, I think is its uh, uh, title. Uh, and you seem to have structured the film uh, and written it in such a way that it was based on the chapters of the book and of uh, pretty much the way that Barry has um, set out his life. Uh, the book uh is um an ex uh, an extraordinary um memoir um if that's the term for it it suggested um childhood as uh extremely important as it is to uh everybody but i i i think that i was really um struck by how how much film was referenced uh, through the memoir and of course at the end of the the book there are um the most significant I don't, I don't know if he uses this language but the the most important um uh, plays poetry music films it, it's it, it's a a long a long list um so that to some extent um, suggested, uh, I knew that I wanted to make a, a film. So film was going to be the medium in which I explored Barry's life. But I think it didn't arise until um, after I'd started that it wasn't only film as the medium, it was films Barry had watched um, throughout his life but more particularly as a child that um, would put a further uh, window on Barry's life and be used as a as as a, a, a vehicle to to tell that life and to some extent Barry's book I was just being sort of handed to me it's um 560 pages uh, I think um it's a long book but to some extent the 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 fact that film was so important didn't immediately jump out of me at me and that's one of the features of film that it 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 um provides emphasis um so that was a sort of a bit of a case study on how um, one aspect of Barry's book could be better told in a film than it was in his book. It was there, but it was there with lots of other bits and pieces of information that I didn't immediately grasp. Uh huh. So we'll talk about the film in more detail, your, your documentary. But uh, as it was your first feature film, um, tell me about the production process, because obviously you need financing, you need support to be able to make the film. How did all of that come about? Well, um, I'd done a lot of radio and I, I made many documentaries and the beauty of radio is you can come up with the idea, you can research it, you can write it, you can edit it, uh, you can present it. All of the tools are just with you as one person. Um, film has been very different uh, to that, but new technologies have meant that you're really able to do all of the things that um, I could do uh, on radio, on on um, film, um, the editing platforms, um, 
the the the, 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 the it was a sort of a, a, a reduction to the simplicity of uh, radio. So that was one um, aspect of it. Another aspect was that this arose in the context of a PhD that I was doing uh, at ANU, and uh, it had a different sus uh, subject, but I, um, I think I changed subjects <laughs> on two occasions, but with Barry, I think I, 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 had, I had my person, if you like. Um, so, so there was some uh, support there, um, but mainly uh, what you needed was the time, uh, the interest, and um, uh, the the skills, I suppose, and some of the skills I actually learned from scratch. Um, editing radio is similar. I mean, there are similarities with cutting, um, but the actual digital editing, I really taught myself um, how well, I don't know, but I taught myself through the production of the film. Okay. And it's interesting how the film is very filmic in the sense that you 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 open the film with that proscenium arch, the raising of the curtains uh, and uh, of uh, stills and sequences from various films. So uh, it's sort of almost like a film within a film insofar as the way you uh, portray Barry's uh, experiences and life through film. And, and it is called a film story and the pieces that you're referring to were actually um, filmed in the ARC theatre um, at the National Film and Sound Archive. So when Barry is sitting there on the chair watching the, um, the roll call of uh, films that, he, that have been important to him, um, that took place at the National Film and, so uh, and Sound Archive. And I, uh, um, it, it was both using film and using the films that were mentioned in his book, um, mentioned as important to him. And then there were quite a number of films too that just um, were of the period and uh, demonstrated something that had some relevance to the making of the film. I mean, and so and films were used in in all sorts of various capacities. Sometimes as a as a date stamp. Sometimes as um, uh, bringing to life a person that Barry said looked like somebody in his um, family, um, for example. Um, uh, sometimes um, Barry, in the context of his book and in the context of my film, delivers very um, uh, interesting and poignant and, um, uh, well, th that'll do, um, film, film reviews. Um, so there are a, a number of film reviews in the context of, of the film too. Um, one that I can remember offhand is um, uh, Modern Times. Autumn Sinatra, Sinatra is a is another one that uh, where he um, delivers a, a sort of a film review, if you like. Exactly. Barry, uh, coming back to you for a moment, growing up in Geelong and your first experiences of cinema um, and uh, the films that you saw obviously had a, a real impact on you and continued throughout your life. Um, what was it specifically about seeing films on the big screen that was so important to you? Well, it was obviously the 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 immediacy of the impact, uh, particularly with the coming of uh, uh, color film with Technicolor. And uh, I mean, to give an example. Um, uh, although I was born in Geelong, we were in Melbourne uh, from when I was three, but I, we used to spend all our holidays down at Geelong. And that was when I'd sometimes go to movies, maybe two or three times a week at a very, very early stage. Uh, but if you take a film like, say, um, 
Well, modern times is one excellent example, but the other one I was going to say was um, uh, Fantasia. Uh, Fantasia, the, the Walt Disney film with the extraordinary images of, of music created by Disney and his uh, animators, so that he had an exposure, or I had an exposure, say, uh, to, uh, uh, well, the Toccata and Fugue in D minor by J.S. Bach, or indeed uh, the Rite of String by Stravinsky at the age of eight. And you see that the impact of it was so powerful because one had never seen anything remotely like it before. Um, and similarly, uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, Chaplin in The Great Dictator and uh, with its very pointed uh, political analysis. I mean, I was a political junkie really from about the age of six. And uh, so by the time I saw it, uh, uh, The Great Dictator, I was eight, and I was by that stage quite a mature political commentator. How very interesting to hear that. I love the way in the film, uh, I, I don't know if that's your invention or Gary's, uh, you categorise people insofar as if they're a plus or a minus based on the year that you were born. Yes. <laughs> I, I found that a very interesting concept. <laughs> well, I, the, but the whole idea of historical continuity uh, is extraordinary and, and working out where people are in the procession. The, we're in this continuum between birth and death and we work our way through. And it, now that I've just turned 90, uh, I'm very conscious that uh, we're getting very much towards the, the end. And uh, so I'm, I'm very conscious of this sense of continuity and relativity. Okay. And All right. Peter, if, if yes. I um, jump, jump in there, uh, yep. one, of, one of the chapters of the film, but I think what the film tries to do overall is to give some appreciation of how Barry's mind works. So um, putting the plus and minus um, was definitely came from Barry. Oh, yeah. The idea of actually placing it on the film um to 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 give some idea of you know what was going on with him um i think the the film supplied itself it, it was really to um to to give some indication of how barry's um, mind works um another um couple of things that that had occurred to me um were, were films that influenced me in the making of this film in the sense of films that uh, gave me a, a sense of what I was aiming for and uh, with Barry um, there was that sense of trying to get closer to him to get a closer viewing and a film that really uh, influenced me and that was The Fog of War with Robert McNamara speaking to camera and Errol Morris used this device, which I think he called a, an interotron, but it was really um, having the subject, uh, McNamara in this case, stare directly at the camera. And this was to give a sense of getting some sort of interior view of the person that was um, uh, talking to camera and giving and 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 talking about their life so um the the fog of uh, of war was a uh, an important uh, film and another crazy film and <laughs> it doesn't really uh, befit being in this company or in barry's company but it's a film called dead men don't wear plaid and it's a steve martin film where he's cutting together all of these yeah. um, film noir um, examples where he's on the phone talking to um, uh, Humphrey Bogart and those sorts of things. But the idea of um, using bits and pieces of film, um, I think probably came um, from that source. And also, I, I, I think it was 
the idea that Peter was referring to before, you've got to get, you know, budgets and filmmaking's expensive. But this, this was a way of um, not getting me to take or try and convince Barry. I mean, he was very a willing subject, but, but you know, to have him hanging out of aeroplanes or going into, you know, reenactments or that sort of thing. So the idea was to have him staring at the camera and be able to bring the world that he describes to him. Exactly. And that I think that works really well uh, in the film, that uh, that contrast between the uh, the moving images of the various films and Barry talking directly to camera, I think is, is very effective. Uh, look, there's so much to cover. Uh, Gary, I want to ask you about getting the rights and permissions to show all the film clips that you are uh, able to screen in uh, the documentary, because I can imagine that there would be costs involved or there would be rights issues, there would be permissions, a whole range of things. How, how did you go about doing that? Well, cautiously, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to give an answer which uh, might shock you all, um, but I realised very early in the piece um, that to get those sorts of rights and permissions on, I was perfectly prepared to put myself through that exercise, but I saw it taking years. I saw it not um, being concluded in time, any time. It, it may never have been concluded. So I relied on... Um, I suppose the, uh, I have got a legal background, so I, I had a little bit of an inkling of what could be done here. But I, I um, uh, basically got a legal opinion as to how I could use the films in um, criticism, in parody, in the creation of a, a, a separate artistic uh, piece, uh, in homage, there are a whole range of different uh, of, ex of exceptions to copyright that I was seeking to draw this film under, and um, it was a piece of um, uh, it was in an academic uh, context that I was doing. I wanted it to be played, and it has had um, a season at uh, Cinema Nova, and it's it's been played at, at different spots. But fundamentally, um, it was a it was a work of exploration in an academic co context, and uh, I did write an exegesis on the strength of it, going through all of the steps that I had undertaken taken in the making of the film. Um, so um, I, I wasn't. Uh, um, plundering the uh, film for the purpose of making myself into a rich man. Uh, not that I thought that that was ever going to happen, but um, but it, but I, I I think it was uh, considered conscientious uh, use of film uh, in a legally allowable, sensible context. Okay, that's that's fair enough, and I think there is uh, there are exemptions for educational purposes or for uh, for research purposes or whatever. So anyway, that that's great, Barry. In your list of favourite films that we see uh, early on in uh, Gary's documentary, uh, you've got films ranging from Citizen Kane um, through to Calvary. Uh, in 2014. Um, and I notice how many of those films are such important films, or some of them are monochrome, um, some of them in colour, uh, but many of them have either political or personal or dramatic um, sort of constructions. And I'm wondering about how you decided which were your most favourite films. Well, it... I suppose if, if one had a very long conversation, and of course I did have, I, I had written uh, the list, uh, you know, uh, long before Gary and I were working on, on the project because the, uh, uh, the Thinking Read came out in 2006. Um, 
But if if somebody, say like Philip Adams, had been interviewing me and said, look, we're both involved in film, one of the films that stick in your mind, and if I then got a piece of paper and started writing things out, I would start probably chronologically, but then I'd work my way through and, and, and one linkage would lead to another. And I could say, well, clearly, uh, uh, you know, the late Chaplin had an impact, the early Chaplin didn't very much. Uh, but then I'd go on with um, uh, films that were political indeed. Um, and then, you know, the impact of, of films associated with aesthetics uh, were very, very important. That's why Autumn Sonata, for example, the Bergman film, which was mentioned uh, um, earlier on by uh, by Gary, uh, and in a way that that list, just as the other lists I've got in in the book, like the lists of world heritage sites that I've been to that mean a lot, uh, they're all interconnected because they're they're part of that continuity of my life, um, and I suppose if I had a piece of paper and started uh, working my way through uh, and, and did the list again without looking at the, the book itself, I'd probably come up with very much the same list. Again, the way my peculiar mind works. Okay. I mean, what stands out for me, I mean, there's such a terrific array of films, but uh, Raoul Ruiz's film, uh, Time Regained, uh, is such an important film for so many reasons insofar as the way of looking back, looking uh, at family, looking at um, nostalgia, looking at connection. Um, there, there's so much going on in that film. And I can see how many of the films that you uh, have chosen and that Gary you have also uh, put into the film uh, have those sorts of connections that yeah. um, are very important in terms of life story. Well, I, look, I think in a way my great strength, I mean, I see myself as being um, uh, probably a second rate um, um, intellect, but I am good at making linkages. I think that's my great strength in a way. That, and sometimes I bring together linkages, whether it's been in science, whether it's been in politics, whether it's been in aesthetics, whether it's been in music. I see linkages and sometimes people don't understand and then when you look at them they say oh yes now you draw attention to it it's obvious that there's a linkage and that and that they they interact and that there's a cumulative um, effect so um uh you know i can see that that i i mean what i said in the book was that i had this sense of being it was like building up a sculpture uh, that creating something it was like building up a sculpture. You had an armature and you you put new things on and you built it up and it became more and more more and more significant. And then people can say, ah, I recognize what it is. I recognize it's a Trojan horse, for example. But they they don't quite know where it's starting, but they know where it finishes up. Okay, very good. Now, there, there's so much that is covered in this documentary. And one of the key aspects, of course, is politics. Um, and I noticed, by the way, that there is a, a mention, uh, a tribute to um, uh, Philip Chubb, um, who wrote uh, the Gillard Rudd years, um, Power Failure, Rudd and Gillard. Um, and I can see how that may have had a fair bit of influence on you, perhaps, as well as a number of other things, uh, Barry, on your political career. Well, I mean, the point is that, um, you know, I was obviously uh, in the seat of law when I went to the federal parliament in 77. Um, I was, um, I held that seat from 77 until uh, 1998. And then I did everything that I could to make sure that um, uh, Julia Gillard got up. The reason was that uh, both uh, Ralph Willis and I had retired at the same time, and we would agreed between us that we'd do everything we could to make sure that a female succeeded us 
And so what happened was in his seat of uh, Jelly Brand and my seat next door in Lawler, uh, that the only candidates who put up were women. So, and I, it was clear that Julia was far and away the most accomplished of the, the women there. And I did everything I could to help get her up. And I'm in that rather, I wouldn't say I was influenced so much by the, by the book uh, that you refer to, it, but from my own lived experience. And I suppose I'm in that rather odd situation of being one of a handful of people. I mean, um, uh, John Faulkner is another one a handful of people who've got a very good relationship with both Kevin Rudd and, and Julia Gillard, that we've, we've maintained a, a very close relationship with each other. And uh, there are really only a handful of people probably in that category. Okay. So Gary in cover, go on, yes. I, I just, um, if you don't mind, I wanted to add a gloss to what, um, Barry yep. uh, was saying that um, uh, Philip Chubb was a very dear friend of mine um, and he of course had been the, the um, force behind the ABC series uh, Labour in Power um, and he was a, a very fine journalist as that um, book that you referred to power failure uh, um, testifies to um, but I, I wanted to honor him in some way um, and and that's why the the film um, pays tribute to him as a um, an important um, person uh, in Australia um, but also as a very dear friend of mine sure so, Gary, in uh, covering so much of Barry's life, the the politics, the uh, growing up, the childhood, the uh, the film influences, the um, the people he met, the uh, environmental issues, uh, the science that uh, was so important to Barry, etc., and capital punishment, which uh, came up later as a, as a major issue. How did you juggle all of that to give everything the right balance? Well, there's a sense in which um, I didn't juggle it so well in the sense that there has been um, criticism of the film that, and, you know, Barry had noted this too, that it ends, you know, roughly in his 30s. But m my way, I guess, of juggling uh, such a copious life was to concentrate on the elemental building blocks that <clears throat> excuse me that um uh that um you could you could say formed and shaped barry so that anything that came up in his later life had a direct reference to his earlier life so my attempt was to make to make sense of Barry and the things that he went on to do by saying, well, a lot of these things were present in childhood and in adolescence and in those first uh, 35 years. Um, for, for example, um, you know, the picker box uh, period uh, is, is running from 1960 to um, 1968. So that's taking Barry you know, into his um, mid thirties, but it was a, an extremely um, Im Im important um, uh, period. Uh, that a lot of the um, capital punishment um, uh, issues and and Barry's uh, extraordinary fight to stop the capital punishment of Ronald Ryan. Well, that was in 1967, so it's in that period. So he's he, he's had a very very full life um, into his 30s. He's gone on to have a much fuller life, but the life um, that he has led subsequently has very diff definite um, connections to his earlier life. Sure. 
Um, so, Barry, how do you respond to that? Because w would you, for example, have liked to have seen uh, more coverage of later events after uh, that important uh, aspect of you being anti-capital punishment? Look, I, I, I go back to what I said earlier. It, it's Gary's film, Gary's concept, and it was not, I didn't want to be in effect saying, look, here's, here's my perspective, here's what you want, this is what I want, and I, I think you better go along with what I want. It was his project. I was happy to collaborate. I mean, there are some later things in it. I mean, for example, uh, there's a quite a touching uh, section, or there was a very touching section that we did when uh, we went to visit Goff in his last years. Uh, that was going to be it. And then I thought, because... Goff seemed to be, it was really within probably a few months of his death. In the end, it was decided not, not to include it, even though historically, you know, it would have been quite significant because Goff looked so frail and so difficult that it would be not perhaps the way he would want to have been remembered, but I wouldn't want to remember him like that. So Gary, with great sensitivity, uh, cut that out um but no i'm uh, the point is i i have no i don't question his his sense that you went to a particular stage in this case essentially around uh 1967 um and, and brought an end to that uh it was simply a slice of life a slice of experience and how you had that the implications of the film culture something of has stayed with me ever since. Um, and I, I think he's done it very well. I mean, if I were doing the editing, which I wasn't, if I was doing the editing, there are one or two micro changes that I might have suggested, but basically it's his film, his concept, and I think he's done wonderfully well. Fair it, enough. It, it, can, can I, um, do you mind if I re-enter? Please. Uh, I, 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 you asked before about the motivation for the for the film, and if you look at Barry's life and the many many things that um, he has done, you would be you could say, "Oh, Barry, uh, he's that extraordinary collector, isn't he?" Or um, Barry talking about his uh, enormous knowledge as was displayed in in uh, you know the picker box uh, period oh uh, Barry uh, he seems to know everything there is about Bach he's he, he's extraordinary uh, Barry the um, capital punishment uh, campaigner um, or anti um, capital punishment um, there are so many the science minister the the the, the person who's um uh, I think he says the 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 only one that's um, uh, a member of all four learned societies. So there are so many things, and this I suppose is the, coming to the nub of what I'm saying. That my film, to some extent, was rising in defence of Barry for that great um, um, capacious life that he has lived, but there's a lot of cheap criticism of Barry because he wasn't in the cabinet, because he wasn't prime minister. And um, th there, there are a lot of people that, um, because Barry, I suppose, is um, so accomplished and has so much capacity, there is a sense that he is also easy to bring down, you know, because he's knowledgeable, because he's earnest, because he's done this and that he's he's he is an example of the tall poppies um syndrome and um he is also uh an example of we need to explore different ways of measuring success in our society um and get away from the the cheap footnoting or dispensing with a person because they they're not in the cabinet 
or because they're not uh, important because they're not the prime minister. Um, and I wanted to, in a sense, uh, um, defend Barry, not that he was ever asking for that, but, but to de defend about that superficial notion of success that um, we, we have, particularly in political circles. Very fine comment. Absolutely. I fully support that. Um, and we're, we're uh, hedging around the editing process for uh, uh, in some of the comments. Gary, can you talk about your process? Because with all those film clips, so much material with Barry speaking to camera, etc. How did you make those difficult decisions about the uh, the final shape of the film? I think, I think Peter, um, a lot of it was iterative as they say it was it didn't start off as being a fully um formed film where i knew exactly what i was doing um a lot of it was uh informed by the the, the hints and um uh breadcrumbs that barry had left um for me throughout the oral history and throughout the book so you know, naturally, I went to the films that he mentioned that had most influenced him. I went to those bits and pieces in the in the book where he's referring to um, a, a particular film or um, a likeness that's been brought together, uh, br brought uh, about um, to a character in a film. So I I I did all of that. Um, I went to many of Barry's events, um, politics in the pub. Um, I interviewed him at different places. We went, we went to um, Sydney and uh, um, uh, uh, looked at that um, film where, I've just forgotten the name of the filmmaker, it's terrible, but where um, 24 hours of the, of the clock is gone through um but by, by um by a a filmmaker and it takes place over a 24-hour period with with slices of each uh, of many many films much more than in barry jones in search of lost time but but um it's 24 hours of film reference um done in uh, a similar sort of way without any kind of copyright uh, issues uh, entering into the frame. Okay. Uh, Barry, can I ask you about the, uh, the picker box period? Because um, how do you look back on that? Because it's certainly um, made you quite prominent uh, to yeah. the uh, Australian public uh, variety that was attached to that. Look, I've got mixed feelings. I mean, sometimes it, uh, uh, later on when I was a minister and so on, it was sometimes a bit confronting if you'd, and this often happened, you'd meet people in the street and they'd say, Barry Jones, oh, I said, always used to watch you and pick them up. What are you doing now? And I thought, if they don't know I'm a minister, admittedly not a cabinet minister, but a minister in the Hawke government, if they, if they're, knowledge of me is simply what it was back in the 1960s, then something's gone wrong. But on the other hand, the thing that struck me, and this has been particularly characteristic of the celebrations of my, or the observation of my uh, 90th birthday, that I've been surprised by the number of letters that I've had from people and emails, I don't know where they've got the email address from, but still, from people who say, when I was a kid living in Horsham, I used, my mother used to say, you've got to watch this, this chap on television or listen to him on the radio. And it's had an influence on me on the last 60 years of my life. You know, and that's really quite touching. And people would say, if I hadn't been listening to you, my life would have gone in a completely different direction. So it's extraordinary that, in a way, uh, I can see that the picker box material may really have been more serious in its impact than I thought at the time. That it was not just entertainment, that a lot of people said, look, 
the way in which you analyze the problem and emphasize the the uh, you know the need for evidence on things. This is really quite profound. And I remember, I mean, the story which uh, I can't resist. Uh, years ago, I remember I was walking down near the the, the the Grand Hyatt in Melbourne with the jet by equivalent in Japan, the the Japanese uh, uh, ambassador, and we signed some kind of memorandum of association. I've forgotten. Anyway, we're walking down the very dignified way down to the Grand Hyatt, and a truck pulled up at the side, and the, and the driver wound his window down and said, Hey, Baz, who was the first British Governor General I, uh, of India, eh? Hey, hey? And I remember the expression on the face of the Japanese ambassador because he was nothing like this had ever happened in Tokyo. You know, the idea of first of the minister could be from country. But secondly, somebody who said, what is the code of language say, I, you've been part of my life for, you know, 50 years, whatever it was. At that stage, of course, uh, going back probably 25 years. Um, and, and the significance of it remained. What an incredible story. And, <laughs> and you never know how you can be remembered sometimes. Exactly. So I found that very interesting. <laughs> uh, well, so, I, I know, for example, that that, that yeah. because Dame Patty, Bob Menzies and his wife always used to watch. And she was a great fan of mine, you see. But it was really Pickerbox that had an impact. And you'd think, well, a, a conservative prime minister wouldn't be interested. Well, he was. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Gary, I, I noticed that your film played in London and uh, was part of the Portobello Film Festival. I'm interested to hear how uh, your, the film has travelled insofar as it's screened in the UK and maybe elsewhere and the responses that you've been getting. I think the key response I um, got I, I didn't attend the Portobello Film Festival, but the key response that I got from it was was that uh, nomination um, in that you know category of best documentary, uh, which I was um, you know very happy for, uh, obviously. And I I watched the awards ceremony on Zoom, and uh, people said very nice things. But when the film was mentioned, there was a um, spontaneous applause. And, and that's always a, a, a nice thing to uh, hear. Um, perhaps very self-indulgently, my wife and I were in um, Israel on New Year's Eve, and we arranged for a viewing of the film um, at, at the oldest uh, cinema in Jerusalem. I think it went back to 1924. But it was a, a really wonderful occasion. About a hundred people came, and uh, ad admittedly, it was a it was a tame audience in the sense that they were our friends and uh, contacts. But um, I, I got some very very you know good uh, feedback. Um, the film did have a six week season at Cinema Nova, uh, and uh, um, I think the feedback there was good. I was surprised that, uh, that it ran for that uh, long there. Um, I had some uh, good uh, good reviews, and I think I think it's the sort of film that it, I mean, hopefully it is that is um, an evergreen. It's a subject um, that is not going to. Uh, go away. It's a form of filmmaking that is going to, uh, I hope anyway, is going to be looked at. Um, the, the exegesis I'm going to put out as um, a book, and it really is a, a book of the use of film in political biography using Barry Jones as a case study. Um, I, I think that uh, it has um, other lifetimes a, uh, ahead of it. And uh, I think what is important really is that I, I filmed Barry in many different situations 
there are those three days we had of filming uh, in the Victorian Parliament, the day we had a, a, a filming in Canberra at the National Film and Sound Archive. Um, Barry um, made available, available to me his, the many portraits. He's also a, a gifted uh, photographer. So I've got some extraordinary archive um, from that source um, and from uh, many other uh, sources. And um, there was also um, a cut of the film, a completely um, uh, uh, um, complete cut of the film made when um, uh, uh, we filmed at the Victorian Parliament. That was all changed, but yeah. that is still available as an archive. And that um, raised a number of technical issues which we had to confront. For example, I sat Barry on a very comfortable big red chair and he was bouncing around on it. Also the chair, because a lot of it was green screen or all of it was green screen, it made it impossible to put images behind him. Mm. Um, so that big red chair for Barry's comfort um, became a major sort of technical issue. Uh, we also had a, 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 an, an auto cue, which was uh, an app that I was running from my iPhone to an iPad over the camera, and it, it got out of sync. So I was directing and, and Barry was either catching up or ahead of me, and uh, that uh, led to many sort of technical issues that we had to debate and talk about it. Um, there was a, a, another issue where Barry had had some uh, dental work done, uh, which I didn't see because he's such a lively um, mm. speaker and he's there and he throws himself into everything. Um, but other people noted, and I think at one stage, Barry might have been, a, you know, a little uh, sensitive um, uh, about it. So, so that, uh, that, that um, was an issue and, um, and took up many, many hours of trying to cure dumb directing decisions that, <laughs> that I'd made early, early uh, in the piece. A learning work in progress. I like that uh, sort of concept in many respects, and I like that there's a, a director's cut and uh, and uh, the exegesis that's going to happen. That's that's all fantastic. Uh, Barry, can I bring this back to the issue of film and popular culture, and can I tie in the National Film and Sound Archive on this? In your time in Parliament, what was your view or what influence did you have in terms of Australian film culture, of uh, aspects of, uh, uh, of life in Australia and using film and promoting film as uh, so being so important and preserving film as being so important uh, as part of uh, Australian life? Well, I mean, I... Uh... I don't want to exaggerate my role, but I think I played quite a significant role as it happened because of, oddly, um, a good relationship that I had with John Gorton. And Gorton was anxious to find policy areas that Holt hadn't been involved in because he wanted to differentiation when he took the leadership and he wanted to be able to say, look, these are new policies. And film was one of them. And the result is that I was appointed, first of all, as the uh, uh, a member of the film and the interim, um, uh, the, the interim college, the interim uh, uh, council for the creation of the film and television school. I was on that. Uh, I was uh, a foundation member of the Australian Film Development Corporation, later, of course, the AFC. And then ultimately, when Goff came in, I was the first chair of the, um, I was the first chair of the Film and Television School. 
And then after that, I was the chair for years of the Australian Film Industry, um, Institute. So I really, you know, with Philip Adams, I think we did play quite an important role. Mm. And we, uh, you know, we won that, um, um, you know, the Lyle, um, uh, you know, the AFI um, award for, for contribution to filmmaking. Uh, they were kind enough to uh, uh, give me the prize on, on one of the years. So I, I, I did play a very active role in the whole thing, in, in getting film up. And um, uh, this is perhaps not the time to talk at any length about what's happened in recent years, but it's certainly true that I played, I think, you know, quite a useful role in that early period when we had that initial takeoff and where people like, say, Fred Skepsy were starting to get first a national reputation and an international reputation. And Bruce Beresford, people like that, they were, we were very close in working together. And so I, you know, I, I really was quite excited about the role that I played in and around the development of the film school and promotion of a film culture. Excellent stuff to hear that. And uh, look, we'll have some questions from uh, everyone in a moment. A few more things I wanted to ask. Barry, can you talk about Louise Lovely? Oh, yes. Well, Louise Lovely lived... Uh, <laughs> yes, there's quite a bit in my autobiography about Louise Lovely. She lived opposite where we lived in, um, in uh, Manor Grove, Caulfield. And she was, I think, quite taken with me as a as a kid and she uh, so I spent quite a lot of time talking to her about her early film experience and her husband uh, Bert Cowan was the um, the manager of the um, the Hoyts Theatre down in St Kilda near you know near St Kilda Beach and so uh, I did spend quite some time with her and she was she used to show me her albums and show me photographs and show me all the jewellery that she had and so on. She was a very, very interesting, very interesting person. And um, uh, and then they moved, they moved away and to another state. And of course, I didn't see her in the last years of her life. But there was a, a period of probably two or three years when I was about, I don't know, perhaps eight to ten, something like that, where I saw quite a lot of Louise Lovely. What an interesting story. <laughs> I, I do regret, Peter, uh, by the way, that um, there, there, we didn't have Australian films or a, a sampling of Australian films. I think that that is an omission from, from, yeah. from, the, from the film and, and it would have been... Um, uh, better and a, a, a greater recognition of place to have some more references apart from Louise Lovely to Australian yeah. films. Yeah. Sure. And the McDonough sisters, of course, as well. I knew a couple of the uh, McDonough sisters but later in life. Okay. Have, what an interesting history and perspective. Barry, what would you regard as your most significant legacy? Oh, the two things are really the 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 um, my role in the abolition of the death penalty in Australia, which is probably the issue I felt well one of the two issues I felt most strongly about. The other thing was bringing climate change on the political agenda. I was the first Australian politician that I can find any record of who was talking about the issue. And I mean, it's a sense of profound frustration that I was first, I did my first broadcast um, on, the, on the radio on climate change in 1967, if you could believe. Uh, and then but as a politician, I was raising the issue from the early 1970s. And I mean, when you reflect, when you reflect that 50 long years has gone by, it's a, uh, extraordinarily uh, frustrating uh, to think how long it's been, you know, how long it's taken to get it part of the political consciousness. Yeah. And then I'd say after that, 
it's really been a matter of trying to emphasize all the time the, the importance of, of separating opinion from evidence. And the danger is, and it's that the problem of fundamentalism, uh, in a way, to say, I know what's right, and there's only one way of looking at it, and it's my way. And if you don't do it my way, then I can take any action I can. And I don't have any evidence. It's the way I feel. And that's very important. And I've been saying that over and over again. And I'm afraid it's one of those sort of Cassandra-like uh, moments where, you know, one's been justified and one's concerns. Very interesting to hear that. And Barry, I must ask you, have you seen a film recently that uh, has gone into your favourites list? The Quiet Girl, the recent Irish film, The Quiet Girl was, was very good. And in fact, I've become very interested in those Irish films. And I tell you what I was particularly struck by, not from the theatre, but not, not in, a, in a movie theatre, but is the... Uh, that extraordinary thing that you can get on um, uh, either YouTube or the SBS uh, download, Bad Sisters. Bad Sisters, it's a 10 part series. Uh, it's an adaptation of a, um, of a I think a Danish uh, series that's set in Ireland, wonderfully acted, very funny, very dark, but very serious and it really, it really deals with the combination of misogyny and murder. And it, it's, it's terrific. If you haven't seen it, don't miss it. Bad Sisters. What a recommendation. <laughs> I'll look out for it. Gary. No, no, I you'll have, have to uh... find it. You won't look out for it. You'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Barry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Gary, I must ask you, are you now looking perhaps to make another film or even a sequel to your film with Barry? I have got a, uh, a couple of films uh, in, the, in the making. Um, and it, it, um, one of them deals with that um, whole issue of um, opinion, partisanship, um, the forcing people into corners where all they can do is yell at one another, um, that whole issue of doing politics differently. And uh, I know people have been trying to uh, perfect human institutions for thousands of years, but what Barry was talking about with uh, climate change, we are at an existential point where um, if we don't um, take seriously doing politics differently, bringing a different approach to really critical issues, which Barry says he's been talking about climate change for um, 60, uh, for since 1967, um, then um, them, and, and in fact, a, a lot of people have reached the point where they're, they're, they are talking about um, the extinction, extinction of uh, living um, creatures on earth. Um, that should be an incentive for people to um, think more seriously about the way politics is conducted. So, um, I am making a film uh, based on my wife's uh, Senate bid in the ACT um, uh, w w with, with the idea of doing politics differently. But by doing politics differently, a lot of the weaponry that people have been skilled in for um, many years, um, you can't then use because it's much easier to attack and to criticize and to pull people down uh, than it is to go the other um, direction. So how do you come up with um, with a, conv a convinc convincing language that causes people 
to think seriously about doing politics differently. That's that's um, one of the films that I have um, been spending a bit of time on. Oh, sounds terrific. And I'm sure uh, Donald Trump will be your first uh, visitor. Uh... Well, he does uh, <laughs> flicker in and out, and I hope out. Uh... <laughs> Fair enough. Look, here is an opportunity. We've only got a few minutes left for questions now from uh, everyone who's been uh, uh, listening to uh, this discussion. And uh, what a great opportunity. Please ask away. Uh, well, if I could just um, moderate it a little bit. Um, the first question, Peter, that we had in the chat was from um, Philip Noyce, and it relates to um, what Barry was talking about just a couple of minutes ago about his role in the film industry. So, uh, Philip, if you could um, speak up. Barry, I think maybe you're being modest when you say you had a little bit to do with the film industry. Um, I don't think any of us would be sitting here if it wasn't for you. But I've always wondered, what did you and Philip Adams tell John Gordon that caused him to initiate such extraordinary policies that kick-started an Australian film industry, uh, policies that included the starting of a film school, um, a film development corporation, an experimental film fund. I mean, where did all this, uh, these ideas come from and how did you convince a conservative politician to adopt such strategies? Well, first of all, I had a curious, I mean, I can't completely explain it, but I had quite a good personal, I had a strong personal relationship with Gordon over a long period because there are times when he was never included in the government. He was never a minister for years and years and years. And we'd run into each other. We might go and have a coffee or sometimes a drink. And he would talk to me, but I never broke his confidences. And so I had a a very strong personal linkage with him. And when I and played a, I played a kind of role in helping him get up, funnily enough, because I was the, um, it was when I was doing um, the talkback program and I did a critical interview. Well, it wasn't critical. I did an interview with him, which I actually, I gave him the questions in advance, which I know isn't, exactly according to Hoyle, but, uh, and the result is, that was the thing that said, I'm Australian to the bootstraps, and I'm, you know, Menzies went in one direction, I'm going in another direction. So it was easy to say to him to say, when you developed a knowledge of Canada, for example, how did you know about Canada? He'd say, only from film. What did you know about Japan? Well, that was only from film. What did you know about Denmark? only from film. I said, well, what do you think the rest of the world thinks about Australia? And he said, well, I suppose we don't have any films to show. And I said, that's right. And so the result is he became quite convinced that this was a critical thing. And I always remember on one occasion, we were lucky because of course, Goff was of the same view. And I remember one memorable weekend when there was a debate on in Canberra uh, about the future of film in Australia. And I've forgotten whether I wrote Gorton's speech and Philip wrote Goff's speech or whether it was the other way around, but it didn't matter. They were essentially the same speech and we, irrespective of who we wrote for, it was the same message. And so there was that brief period of an upsurge in which film was being, was being central to the idea of expressing Australian identity. Well, all I can say from the thousands like myself who have made films starting at that time, all I can say is a hearty thank you. Glad to do it. And there's some wonderful, some wonderful gifted people who came and you were one of the great ones. Yeah, I'd also say that you really had an effect on so many Australians of my age. I was born in 1950. Just the respect for knowledge that you instilled in all of us um, was really profound. If you go on like this, I'll burst into tears. <laughs> well, very touching. Yeah, well, you touched us all. Thank you again. Thanks, Phil. 
Um, just going through some of the other questions um, that have come up in the chat, uh, I'd like to throw over to, um, to Evan now with a question. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Um, Baz, Pete asked you before what you thought your legacy, your greatest legacy was, but I just want to know what the most rewarding part of your life you think might have been um, up to this point. It's very hard to answer that. Yeah. Very hard to answer that because in many, uh, you can see that the long period, you know, if, I think of the long period that I was in the Commonwealth Parliament, the 21 years I had there, I would say that the, of the 21 years, maybe five or six of the years felt productive and the others, you're just banging your head against the wall all the time. So it wasn't altogether easy. I mean, I've had, to coin a phrase, uh, a fortunate life, and I've managed to, you know, reach the age of 90 and we're in pretty good nick, I, I would think. But I, it's very difficult to pick out a particular period and say, uh, you know, this, this, is, this has been the high point. I think I've shown some consistency, some continuity but it's i must say the the expressions of affection and even i'd have to say love that have come out around the events we had with the 90th birthday celebration they had three extraordinary events uh in melbourne and i was just staggered by the warmth and the and the touching nature of the qualities uh, of, of the of the tributes and so on and uh, so that's 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 been worth. Uh, I feel that recognizing the influence that I've had on others that's that's valuable. But it's it's not as, it's it's been obviously a matter of continuity. But I'd last I'd say the last month uh, when I had the 90th birthday in October, that really was a um, has been a high point. Quite extraordinary. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, man. Uh, Can I add to to yeah. one of the high points that um, Barry's been refer re referring to? Um, as far as I know, and I've done a lot of looking around, uh, Barry Jones in Search of Lost Time is the only full-length feature of an Australian politician that's been shown in a cinema which I think is startling as yeah, a, yeah. and th there, there are many reasons we can go into it, but that, that I, I hope that that is recognized as an achieve, an, an achievement. Oh, I'm, very proud, I'm very proud of your film, but it's your film. <clears throat> but it's about you. When do we get the director's cut, Gary, with all the, all the outtakes? <laughs> <laughs> That would be really good if you did, if you were able to throw all those bits in and maybe not the general distribution, but um, put it somewhere where we could access that. But I, I think I will put it do together, obviously. Th thank you, Evan. I think I will do that because I think that it, from it, it, it's interesting and it's presenting um, Barry uh, in in a slightly different way. Um, and it would be, and it's got slightly different content. And I um, compare that or that experience where we've been able to gather so much material about a particular politician to Alfred Deacon, for example, uh, the most that we've got are two or three seconds of him at the opening of Parliament House in Canberra in 1927. So no, 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 he was dead by 1919. Fair go. I think it was the. Um, uh, I I know the film you mean, but he it was um, he died in 1919. <clears throat> uh, okay, I'll <laughs> be corrected on that, but um, I don't think I'm wrong about the no. Fact. It's a very it's a tiny, absolutely tiny. I think it is in fact the 1901 opening. Is that yeah, that would be my suggestion too. Yeah, 
okay i'll i'll go and and uh, and check that but um and thanks but he was never governor general of india no <laughs> <laughs> Um, if I can just um, see if we can get through a couple more of the questions before yep. our time runs out. Um, Anne Davis had a question about, I guess, um, about future screenings, potential screenings of this film. So, Anne, would you like to speak up? Are you there, Anne? Perhaps she's not there anymore. Um, so maybe I'll ask the question. She, she asked specifically whether the National Film and Sound Archive were likely to, um, well, when they would screen the film. I don't know whether there's anyone that could speak for that, but Gary, you probably have some sense of if it's ever going to be um, screened anywhere else where that might be. Um, I think the um, we have had sort of periodic um, uh, screenings and uh, I'd be certainly open to the National Film and Sound Archive, you know, having one of Barry Jones. Uh, that would that would be fantastic. Um, I'm happy to screen it when, whenever it's called for. Um, so, uh, if, if anybody could facilitate that, that would be wonderful. Well, that might possibly bring us on to someone who might be able to, but I don't want to dob him in. But uh, Ray Edmondson also had a question about um, about the the establishment of the National Film and Sound Archives. Um, so, Ray, are you there? Um, yes, um, Mary. I wonder whether you um, the, the archive was established by the Hawke government in 1984. Um, I wonder if you have particular recollections of um, of that event and the, the politics leading up to it when it was. Um, had to be separated from the National Library against their, against their wishes. I'd have to, look, I'd have to go back and think about it again. Um, um, yes, I, I do remember, um, I do remember it was one of the blues that went on um, at the time. Um, but I, uh, no, I, look, I'm sorry, you, 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 it, I, I would have put that question on notice, I think, but uh, it's certainly worth exploring. I'll think about it and get back to you, if you like. That's uh, really good. Thanks, Barry. Um, and look, in, 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 in uh, response to um, the possibility of, of Gary's film being shown at the NFSA, um, I, I, um, the Friends will certainly suggest that to um, the programmers um, uh, at the archive, because I think uh, it would be a terrific occasion if Gary could be there to introduce and speak to it. Um, and, um, well, Gary, uh, uh, you'll be there, I guess, on the, on Thursday night for uh, Ken Williams' lecture as well, but, uh, yes, yes. Um, which, um, yeah, um, but I think uh, I've seen Gary's film twice. Uh, I'd love to see it again on the big screen, um, and I think it would be, um, it could be uh, quite a memorable night to show it and to have Gary um, speak to it, and even to have Barry on the screen in the in the cinema i've seen this done yeah um, just be just being interviewed um online uh, as part of that part of that discussion that would be brilliant i think we're both open to that <laughs> if i may as the director <laughs> uh, um, i have to have to say that uh, barry says um, and he said throughout, Gary, it's your film. But there was quite an amount of dialogue backwards and forwards, um, which I think really aided uh, the whole process of the film. Um, there, there were things that, um, that uh, he said, well, you know, um, I'm not so happy with this, or you've... Um, he didn't use this term, but you've nailed that. Uh, this this is what it was what it was like. And I think through this um, dialogue, there was always the attempt to um, aim to get a bit closer to what it felt like to be Barry Jones. Yeah. And one film I didn't uh, talk about was that film uh, being John Melkovic, um, where 
uh, this crazy guy stumbles into the mind through a corridor, or um, uh, I think it's a corridor, I into John Malkovich's uh, mind and the, the disorientation of, of that experience, but uh, also that he's getting to get a sense of uh, what John Malkovich was like by being in his head. Um, not that I'm saying that it's possible to do that with um, complex individuals, but um, through the dialogue that I had with Barry, I think I was able to inch that much closer to what it might be like uh, to be him. Okay, um, if there's, there's one remaining question that's um, been sitting in the chat and it, it's a um, it's had a few iterations, so I'll throw over to Liz Ollie. It's a, it starts with um, a question about um, Barry's interest in the Hitler film. Um, Liz, would you like to ask that question, please? Okay. Um, hi, I'm here. Uh, I yep. can't. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm was interested in the fact that you recommended a Hitler film, which was made in 1977 by yeah. Sieberborg, but yeah. you didn't um, mention Parsifal, made by the same director. I, I, um, I don't but, think I, I don't think I've seen Parsifal. No, that's yeah, interesting. Well, that's, I recommend it. And mm. I think I, I recommend it, and I think you would like it. Um, it was, yeah, anyway, um, uh, the other thing uh, I recommend, well, I saw the, um, the two films that you have seen, uh, the um, Olivia film in 48 yeah. and the, um, the Kenneth Branagh, I presume, yeah. uh, it was in uh, in the nineties. Um, uh, I wonder if you have ever seen uh, the Russian film made uh, as by a translation of yeah. um, Boris Pasternak. Yes, yes, I have. No, I think that's, I think that's pretty good. I, I, no, I. I I haven't seen it for a while. <laughs> I, yeah, but, no, yeah. I, think, I think it's. I think it's good. I've seen. I think I've seen virtually every. Uh, you know, either Japanese version or, or or Russian version, and so on. I think. Um, uh, I think one of the things that. Um, I do like that perhaps I should have put on the list, but it's more recent, is the version with David Tennant um, uh, as uh, as Hamlet. I think that's an extraordinary, that's an extraordinarily good one. And um, uh, with the wonderful performance um, <coughs> Claudius by, um, oh, Ian McKellen's sidekick, you know, the... Delphine's? Uh, um, uh, Stuart, um, okay. um, I've just for the minute I've just forgotten his name. But the guy who used to do uh, who, who used to do uh, uh, Godot with, with Ian McKellen, you know who I mean. That, uh, I'm sure, Mr. Google. Patrick, Patrick Stewart. But Patrick um, Stewart. I really liked um, Keating's comment about Heitwitz. Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed that. And um, also, um, <coughs> I was interested to hear, uh, to learn that Tiepolo was um, sold by Stalin. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's, yes, absolutely right. Yep. Correct. Okay. Um, I, I think you would really like the Parsifal. Oh, it's, I'll, I'll it's, uh, it's played on a death mask of um, uh, Wagner. Oh, well, I'll, I'll certainly look it up. Uh, it's Patrick Stewart, of course, I was thinking of. Patrick, Patrick Stewart, Stewart yeah. an extraordinary performance as Claudius. I think in the way, it's a, it's a, it's a, he's the best Claudius I've ever seen. Yeah. 
Okay, and I've just got a very brief um, comment. Um, are you implying that Hitler was um, was influenced by Charlie Chaplin in his moustache? I'm. I well. I, what I'm saying, I, it's odd. I mean, it, look, it's one of these odd coincidences that, that are sort of weird that. Chaplin and Hitler were born in the same month of the same year. And it so the result is that when Hitler was a complete unknown and Chaplin was one of the most famous people in the world, it would not have escaped Hitler's attention that they were, in a sense, identical twins. And uh, whether the, the idea of the use of film the use of media, the use of, of you know, communication. Uh, that I'm sure that was part. That was part of it. This is just as we could see that. I mean, it's extraordinary if you go back to Hitler and you saw that Hitler actually saw Mahler conduct, and that he said to, uh, uh, I think it might have been Grunzens. I've forgotten, but one of the film directors he had. He said that he was inclined to think of Mahler. He, you know, that he was one Jew that he put Mahler in, in a different category because he thought that the gestures that he had were so, were so compelling and that you wonder whether perhaps the impact, the impact of, uh, of, uh, uh, the impact of Mahler's gestures were important. And then of course, the other thing that's so extraordinary is that realization, the other coincidence, that Wittgenstein was at the same school as Hitler. Yeah, yeah, I I noticed that. Yeah. Um actually I wanted to say congratulations to both the film filmmaker and the subject. And I really admired your uh David Hockney portrait uh yeah. with photography. Yeah. Um having Thanks. seen the um uh, the exhibition at Heidi, uh, which was, uh, yeah, and mm. which had the note from the filmmaker who uh, caused a dud in mm. the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks a lot, Bruce. Okay, I think we might uh, wrap it up there. It's been such a pleasure talking to both Barry Jones and Gary Sturgis about the film, uh, uh, Barry Jones in Search of uh, Lost Time. And it's it's just uh, incredible to uh, talk film in particular, and we can be talking film for another hour or so, I'm sure. So <laughs> thank you very much. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, a pleasure uh, and I uh, hope everyone enjoyed it. And thank you for organizing it. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank yeah. you very much. Terrific. Thank Thanks, you, guys. Thank you, Barry. Thanks a lot. Okay. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. Wenda, unmute yourself. I think Wenda's going to <laughs> formally finish it, but she's muted. <laughs> Gwenda, unmute. I, I yeah, have, good. I have, <laughs> No, actually, uh, Peter, you've said most of everything I wanted to say uh, in thanking everybody, but um, I need to mention the fact that a recording of this session will be available on our website in the next few days with the consent of both uh, Gary Sturgis and Barry Jones, and uh, you'll receive an email with that link about the uh, about that session. And I will also perhaps let the Melbourne residents know that we're having our final event for the year, um, a live event on Saturday, 3rd of December, uh, with um, our wonderful Peter Krauss and our secretary, Joe Wellington, uh, at the helm for a gala showing of a 16 millimeter feature film of Flash Gordon. <laughs> Saturday afternoons uh, serials turned into a feature film of Flash Gordon, Back to the Future. You'll get an invitation for that shortly. Thank you, Peter. Thanks everybody, every, very much. <laughs>